So, uh, Don, first introduce yourself. I'm Don Crane. I am the newly retired uh, law director for Westchester, and I believe I'm the only individual over the past 40 years that has been continuously employed by the township. Uh, and we'll go into that in more detail. But I just want to say it's been my greatest privilege to serve as the law director and chief outside counsel for Westchester, Ohio. Yeah. Great. So when did, you, um, when did you retire? I retired as of 12-31-23. So it's been less than seven, eight days. <laughs> okay. Well, good. We're so glad to have you here to talk a little bit about your story in Westchester. So... First of all, why don't we talk about how you became Westchester's law director? Well, I would divide that into two uh, time spaces. Uh, the first 15 years from 1983 uh, to 1998, I was uh, the chief outside counsel. I wasn't actually the law director. That didn't happen until 1998 when the township decided to become a home rule township, which under statute requires the township to have a dedicated law director who was primarily responsible for all legal. And so that, the last 25 years, I've been doing that. So, uh, and how I became the law director is an interesting story because in 1983, the Ohio legislature passed the State Employment Relations Act, which was a labor act. And at that time, uh, the Democratic Party and the unions actually uh, occupied the governor's chair, the Senate, and the House. So they had pretty much carte blanche as far as what they wanted in the statute. And my uh, good friend Jim Lawrence, who was the chairman of our labor department at Frost and Jacobs, employed me as a newly minted lawyer from the NLRB uh, to help him uh, craft the legislation in a way that it at least gave employers a chance. Uh, in the collective bargaining sphere. So uh, as a result of that, Westchester or, or, uh, Union Township needed to have an outside labor attorney to help them in the uh, upcoming negotiations, which was sure to happen because they had been told by both their fire employees and their police employees that they were going to unionize. So as a result, the three trustees at the time, John Boehner, uh, Steve Powell and uh, Carlos Todd interviewed the five major firms in Cincinnati, including Frost and Jacobs, my firm, and uh, somehow I ended up with the work. I was, it was a very proud moment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but the trustees were uh, very good about uh, giving everybody a full opportunity to interview and be heard. So uh, that's what happened. and. Uh, once I was uh, selected and given the opportunity by the firm to represent Westchester, uh, I found out very quickly that there were additional legal needs that the township wanted in addition to labor uh, because they, the county prosecutor's office, who was responsible for the civil work for townships, just really wasn't equipped very well to handle the work of uh, a growing township. So they started calling me to fill that role, and that's how I got into representing the township in areas outside of labor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's how that began. I became the statutory law director in 1998, which was a momentous year because it, during 1998, the township not only became a, a, a home rule township, it also changed the name from Union Township uh, to Westchester Township, and that took a vote of the citizens. And the reason why that took place was that within probably 100 miles of Westchester, or Union Township, there were several, seven, at least seven other Union Townships. And what was happening is that our dispatch center was receiving calls for these other Union Townships and dispatching our personnel to that same street in, in Union Township. And so there was a, a real danger of a catastrophe uh, or something very bad happening as a result of this communication issue. So it became a necessity 
to change our name. And as a result, we picked Westchester, which was an old name and had been around since the 1820s uh, as a, a stagecoach stop and uh, uh, a post office. Uh, and so the citizens approved that in 1998. And uh, I became the actual law director for Westchester, and I've been privileged to serve since that day. So it was, um, um, you know, people voted, obviously, to choose the name Westchester. Um, I know it was a whole Westchester, claim the name kind of campaign, and it seemed like it was um, a pretty easy ask of our residents and the voters. Did you remember much contention on that topic, or? No, it really was, uh, out of necessity, and uh, I think it passed by 80 some percent yeah. because it made sense, mm -hmm. and it was a good thing to do, and, and historically it was sound because we were adopting a name that was, had been around here in the Westchester area since 1823, and that was the year that uh, the township was created. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the Ohio legislature divided then Liberty Township into Liberty Township and Union Township, which is now, of course, Westchester now. Right. But I want to go back to 1998. Uh, it, it wasn't a shoe-in that I became the, the law director. Because I was the only candidate, obviously, because I had had 15 years of experience with the township and done a pretty good job. Uh, but it was an issue that I didn't live here. The trustees felt that they wanted a law director that lived in Westchester Township. And so I met with the, the trustees, and, and I told them that I, although I lived in Fairfield and had lived there for 20-some uh, years, that I was willing to move. But my problem was that my mother was very, very ill. And I told them at the appropriate time, I promised them that I would move. And so uh, that was 1998. My mother passed away in 2003. And four months later, we, we moved. And we've been happy residents yeah. of Westchester for the last 20 plus years, and yeah. uh, we couldn't be happier. If we go back to the beginning, Don, when you were being interviewed with the, the four other firms that were being considered by the trustees at the time, what do you think really set you apart? Well, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I've a I asked the trustees afterwards, what, what was it about us and about me that stood out to you? And I had... Uh, the, uh, the chairman of our labor department, Jim, Jim Lawrence, brought me along because the firm had opened up a, a, a Middletown office in Butler County in uh, early 1981. And so we were the only Cincinnati law firm that had an office in, in Butler County. So that was a distinguishing factor, I think, and a big factor. And when he brought me along for the interview, he said, Don, I want you to prepare about a two-minute speaking part so that they understand that you're not just a potted plant. And, you know, you can say whatever you think is appropriate. So what I did, and I remember what I said very well, and, and Judge Powell told me later, he said, that was, the, the trustees really liked what I said. And what I said was, I was born and raised in Butler County in Hamilton, Ohio. I now live in Fairfield, and I've lived there for about 20 years. I have an office in Middletown, and I went to college in Oxford. I said, so I know Butler County really well. I don't know a whole lot about Union Township, but I will, if I'm lucky enough to be selected, I will make it a priority to learn everything there is to know about uh, Union Township. And I told them I was relatively new with the firm, less than two years, and that my plate was not quite full and that if I was lucky enough to be selected to do their work, they would be my most important client. And I have kept that pledge all these years. I've had many more clients added to the list and some anchor clients like, like Westchester, but they've always been right at the top mm -hmm. as far as my time and my attention and my love. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned uh, the first set of trustees who interviewed you, and then, but when you became, in 1998, you had to get acceptance from another set of trustees. Yes, that was, uh, I, I spoke to each of the trustees about uh, living in Westchester, and they all understood, and that wasn't a problem. But there's one trustee, uh, Catherine Stoker, 
that really kind of stood out because Catherine was uh, a Democrat, and of course I was involved in the uh, Republican Party, and our firm was viewed as a, as a Republican law firm, although it really isn't. It's, it has prominent members at each party. And so she was at times critical of our uh, cost. You know, we, we cost a little bit more than the average firm, and that that's how you get great lawyers, frankly. So I wasn't expecting that she would vote yes on my contract, and when she did, I was kind of surprised. And I talked to her afterwards. I said, Catherine, I was very pleased to have your vote. I was a little surprised, though. And she said to me, she said, Don, you've done a great job. You've earned it. And I w that was a very proud moment for me. Because she actually is and was uh, the first Democrat elected to public office out here since before the days of Abraham Lincoln. Wow. Because Union Township and, and Westchester has always been very conservative. Mm -hmm. And that's still true today. Mm -hmm. But Catherine was a wonderful trustee. She was a, a social liberal, but a very conservative uh, when it came to money issues. She was a small business person. She understood that dy dynamic and was really behind the great growth that we had in the 90s. Yeah. In our series, we've talked about a lot of um, other trustees, but Catherine's name doesn't come up very often, so I'm glad to have you say a little bit about her because she was here at a very significant time for the township. Yes, she was, and she was always uh, uh, very vocal and uh, always spot on when it came to being on the right side of issues. And I enjoyed working with her, and she really was a great trustee. Mm -hmm. And you know, over the years, I have to say, one of the great strengths of our government here, the township, from the time I started in 1983 until present, has been the great strength and intelligence of our trustees. Over all that time, we've had wonderful trustees, and there have been maybe a few exceptions. There were a few times where there was some faulty thinking that took place by a couple of individuals. But outside of that, we've been very, very blessed. And that first group of trustees was perhaps our greatest uh, of all. Uh, it included John Boehner, uh, who uh, started out as a, a township trustee. And, and shortly after I was hired, uh, he ran for the state house. And I think one of the reasons why he liked me as a candidate for, uh, for council was that uh, our office was in Middletown. And at that time, his state house district included Middletown. He didn't know a soul up there. Mm -hmm. So we uh, helped him with our client base and our friends and, and their PACs. Mm -hmm. And we ha actually helped get John funded. But he, of course, was a wonderful state representative and, and uh, then ran for Congress in 1990 and was elected, uh, won elect. He, he didn't actually receive the endorsement of the Republican Party. They endorsed a, a prior representative, Tom Kindness, instead. But John worked hard and made his case, and he was a brilliant guy and very engaging, and uh, the electorate really took to him and, and elected him by a wide margin. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he was... Uh, in the Congress for 25 years, I think, and in 2010 was elected as the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. is one of the uh, of two men in this area that have had that distinction. And that's a very proud moment for the township. Mm -hmm. And John was truly outstanding. He retired in 2015, uh, just after the Pope came to visit uh, the Congress at his uh, invitation. And he just felt that, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the other uh, trustee that uh, all two, uh, I'll talk about the other two, is uh, Judge Stephen Powell. At, at that time, he was just an attorney, and he was the son of a former uh, House of Representative member. Uh, but he was a, a young lawyer, knew the ropes, and uh, got himself elected first uh, as, as a probate court judge. And he is now, Steve Powell, Judge Powell, is now the longest serving judge in Butler County history. So that's another feather in our cap. You know, this guy has been a great judge. He's been elected and reelected 
by wide margins from the get-go. And he's a very good friend, as is John. And Carlos Todd was the third gentleman. He was a, a business owner uh, and later became a very prominent builder and developer. And he was one of the uh, many builders and developers that developed Westchester, the current Westchester of today. But where he really stood out was that he was in the party leadership of the Republican Party. When it was a good Republican Party, but when he became uh, the chairman of the Republican Party, he took it to a level that has never been seen before, either in this area or the state of Ohio. And, and he led us to some great victories and uh, was just a, a wonderful leader in, in the business community as well. And so with, with, with those three trustees to start out with, it's hard to go wrong. When uh, you were speaking about um, uh, John Boehner, I, it makes me think of when we spoke with our uh, previous fiscal officer clerk, Pat Williams, and asked her about uh, John, and, and uh, she uh, went on about how when she first met him, she knew he was just destined for great things, and she just felt like he had that kind of a, a personality about him. But, I know you worked with Pat Williams as well. So. I did. Pat uh, actually started out working for the Butler County Auditor with my father. Oh, okay. And so they knew each other. And uh, Pat, at the age of, uh, when she retired, she retired at the age of 86. I'm sure she won't mind me mentioning that. <laughs> but she was the oldest living active public official in the state of Ohio in its history and at that time. And she was just a wonderful person, did a great job, and really helped supervise the development of our finance department. Because back then they were clerks, they were called clerks, and then it changed to fiscal officer. But it takes several people uh, to maintain all of the uh, necessary books and records uh, for the township, and she did a wonderful job quarterbacking all that. And she's still with us, still a wonderful person, and she did a great job. We all want to be Pat Williams when we grow yes. up. Yes. <laughs> Very good. So what was Westchester like in, uh, in 1983, 84, when you first uh, joined the team here? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Different, I know. Yes. 16,000 residents, three traffic lights, no collective bargaining agreements. Unbelievable. And, you know, it was really in the early stages of development when those three trustees, and they went ahead and hired their first, one of their major goals was to hire a full-time uh, township administrator because they'd had somebody working part-time and it wasn't working very well. And they all had careers and jobs. And it was growing, and, and to really take the next step, they needed somebody good. And as it was explained to me, they were looking for someone with high expertise in the zoning and development area uh, because they told me I could handle the labor and the personnel stuff. They needed somebody to help them develop the township. And so they hired a guy named Mike Burns uh, from the city of St. Bernard. He was an assistant city manager, but he was in charge of their zoning and all of that and their development. And he had a high degree of expertise in that area. And I'll tell you what, he was just magnificent. He was so the, he was the first full-time administrator? He was the okay. first, first full-time okay. administrator. And I think he was hired in 1985. Okay. Uh, what time of the year it was, but he, he was involved in collective bargaining as well. But Mike was a UC grad, and he actually drafted our first zoning code. He didn't have a lawyer do it. He did it. And it was... Uh, Modified over the years, but it really got us down that right path. The township wanted to have its own zoning code rather than rely on county zoning because a community is only as strong as its zoning code and the enforcement of the zoning code because uh, businesses and individuals don't want to make heavy uh, investments in their property if they can't protect it. And a good, strong zoning code that is held uh, inviolate is very important to the quality of life in a community. 
And they understood that. And Mike Burns really got us started down that road. And uh, I mentioned earlier that he, he was a great administrator. He left here in 1990, 91, in that time frame to become the city manager for the city of the village of Indian Hill, one of the great communities, not only in this area, but in the United States. Mm -hmm. There are people, very famous people from all over the United States that moved to Indian Hill because of the quality of that community. And Mike was their uh, solicitor. He was actually their city manager for close to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And in 1998, I was very privileged to be selected by Mike as their solicitor. Mm -hmm. So Mike and I continued to work with each other really during that seven or eight year hiatus on various cases, but in 1998, I, I had a, uh, and I served 20 proud years as the uh, solicitor for Indian Hill as a result of Mike Burns uh, choosing me, and it worked out very well for both of us. Yeah. Very good. That was a pivotal situation, really, the township taking over its own planning and zoning. And oh, yes. Establishing that was significant. And it was, because it took us to the next level as far as uh, the, the development of the community. We were able to put together a plan that worked well, uh, that uh, helped develop the Union T Center overpass and, and uh, corridor, and a lot of the, and it led to the Transportation Improvement District, which led to really completing the transportation uh, framework for the township that made it easy to get around. I remember in, as late as 2000, uh, there were a lot of traffic jams in this township, and it really wasn't until maybe uh, a year or two later uh, that we had completed 129 and all the other things that tied everything together and made it easier to get around the township uh, traffic jam free. Right, right. <laughs> Help yourself to water or something. Sure. You to take a break. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, there's a few things that I want to talk about. I'll sure. Bring up. The, um, yeah, that was such a pivotal time, kind of in the township, with that decision to just take over the planning and zoning for, you know, to kind of manage your own destiny, right? That's what it was about. Yeah, um, it was. And um, when I first met with the trustees after I was hired, uh, before I met with them, I conducted a wage and benefit survey okay. because I had heard that they had a high turnover of employees. And immediately I could see why that happened because the township didn't have a lot of financial resources. And so they were in the lower tier, like bottom 20, 25% of pay uh, for their key employees, their police fire. And, and services employees. And uh, we had to come up with a plan to fix that. And I asked the trustees, I said, what, is, what are your goals? And they said, one of the top goals, aside from zoning and development, is to uh, improve the quality of our employees and be able to hang on to the good people that we hire. Mm -hmm. Because if they, they got their hands on somebody that was really good, as soon as they were trained, they would go to another city, a nearby city or township, where they could make an additional five or ten thousand dollars a year, and you can't blame them for that. Mm -hmm. So we put together a plan uh, to fix that, and and it was reliant upon the development of the township and the growth of the township, as well as having collective bargaining agreements that that uh, were tight, that didn't have hidden cost. And so what we decided to do was to focus our attention on the financial resources that we had to give employees the highest salary we could afford. And so that meant finding out what the uh, market was for increases that year and add 1% to that. Huh. So over a period of 10 years, uh, I mapped out what it would look like for the trustees, we could go from that lower tier to the higher tier by adding an, initial, an additional 10 or 12 percent. And that worked. Uh, and it worked well with the unions. Uh, when we were meeting with them, 
We told them that we could only do this with their cooperation, but it would take their agreement to have good benefits, but not Cadillac benefits, because who can afford that? And we couldn't have any hidden costs in our collective bargaining agreements. And we, we had to assiduously protect manage, right to manage, our ability to make decisions, free of any uh, handcuffing by a collective bargaining agreement. And so we were able to negotiate agreements with our unions, and I knew their representatives pretty well. Uh, and that compact really worked really well by, by the mid 80s, or mid 90s, I'm sorry. Uh, we, had, uh, we had arrived at the top tier. We had contracts that had no hidden costs. And in addition to that, we assiduously protected management rights. So we didn't have any restraints on making decisions. And all that uh, resulted in our ability to, to attract the best people, uh, the top tier of employees. Mm -hmm. Westchester became a destination for new folks coming out of high school uh, with a bachelor or a, uh, uh, a degree of some kind. Mm -hmm. And it worked really well to get us on the road that we're on right now and have been traveling for the last 25 years. Yeah. So at that time, was there a voter-approved levy to pay for police and fire, or? Yes, it, uh, I'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, the township's main source of revenue was uh, real estate tax. Mm -hmm. And they uh, received a certain amount of income from, from the taxes that are paid to the county as well as additional levies that were passed by the voters. And we've always had a good history in, in Westchester of passing levies when monies were needed to supplement mm -hmm. uh, the general fund for both police, fire, and roads. And I can only think of one time over the last 40 years where a levy failed, and it was because we had two police levies. There was a little bit of confusion, and one of the levies passed and the other didn't, so when we re-ran it the following election cycle, it passed easily. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and the other reason why our levies have passed so easily over the years is the fiscal discipline of the township. Uh, we have run the levies on the basis that these levies will provide us the necessary funds to have top flight police, fire, and roads. Mm -hmm. and it will last for a minimum of five years. And almost all of those levies that have been passed over those many years have lasted, lasted eight, nine, 10, or even 12 years okay. because of good fiscal management and the growth of the township uh, that, uh, that helped uh, add to the, uh, the levies uh, mm -hmm. revenue. Yeah, I um, try to think, you know, when you think about 1963 and forming the first professional fire department here, how were they paid then? I, was there an actual fire levy, I wonder? Or <coughs> well, I, I don't know if you I'm, know. I'm sure <laughs> in it, I, I can tell you uh, how it likely happened, uh -huh. and that was that initially it was paid out of township fu general fund, right. but almost immediately they had to put uh, a levy on the ballot uh, to get a levy passed to fund the fire right. department. So I, I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. Because there wouldn't have been much money collected from inside the <laughs> No, Back then. that's <laughs> that's true. That's true. I don't think. So, um. so I, I just would finish it by saying that by 1995, we had very strong competitive labor contracts that were uh, the standard in the industry, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, and we had the ability to hire the best employees and to keep them. And the reason why the employees like this and their unions went along with it is that if you're in a, a top tier, uh, when you go to retire, the, your retirement income is determined by your highest three years. And so that additional five or 10 grand a year that they're getting because they sacrificed all the bells and whistles in their contract and they accepted benefits that were a little better than average they earn that money for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. 
and it's a good bargain, and it works. Yeah. And our employees understand that. That's why they come here to work, and we hang on to them. We have very little melt, uh, and so by that I mean people that leave mm -hmm. uh, for a better salary somewhere else. We ju we just uh, it's a great place to work. Mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> I think both of us are great. And you think so, too. <laughs> yes. uh, so um, I keep trying to picture the um, three traffic lights. There were a few more here uh, when I was there. But um, when, you were, when, when there were so few traffic lights and um, traffic was backed up, what was, I mean, what kind of things did you see as law director back then? I know you were primarily involved in the contract negotiations, but... What were the other things that kind of elevated to uh, legal matters back at the beginning of your career with Westchester? Well, <coughs> first of all, initially, the ten when, when they got into the, uh, the zoning and, and the uh, development, they, they hired an outside firm because we didn't have that expertise in our law firm. And uh, he, he, he really handled all these, these issues. And then as far as the other part of the development, the, the, the bond uh, issues and things like that, uh, they, they used a, a law firm that had that bond capability that we didn't have at that time. Mm -hmm. Now we have both, of course, and we handle all the, we're privileged to handle all of this. Uh, but the work that I, uh, I did in addition to labor and personnel was more or less just uh, Township issues, you know, uh, related to uh, some some basic legal questions mm -hmm. that would ordinarily be handled by the prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. Now, the prosecutor's office handle all the the criminal matters mm -hmm. related to the uh, the, the uh, county court. Uh, we didn't get involved in that, but it just basically everything else. And there weren't, you know, when constitutional issues came up, for example, are we permitted? to have uh, a prayer at the beginning of our sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Supreme Court has made it pretty clear that you can do that if it has a historical base. And the township has always done that, but somebody called it into question. We did some research on the issue and said, yes, you can do this within certain parameters. And the same thing, with, we handle all the constitutional issues. Uh, one of the issues that came up that uh, not many people know about, but there was a, an attempt at one point by uh, some business people to uh, start a strip joint uh, right at the, the corner of Cincinnati Dayton Road and I-75. Mm -hmm. And we got involved in that uh, as a surrogate for the county prosecutor. Uh, and what we did uh, because I had had some experience with a U.S. attorney and I had worked with uh, some of the agencies, the FBI, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and the township didn't really have any defense under statute to this. And uh, we hadn't really done anything with our zoning code yet to zone it out or to, to limit it. So we, we were desperate to find a way to, to avoid having something like that in our township. So what I suggested to the police chief is, have you hired any new police officers that hasn't been on the street yet? And he said, yeah, we just hired two. I said, well, get them to go down there and get a job as bartender. <laughs> and then I guarantee you after about 30 to 60 days, you're going to find all kinds of liquor law violations mm -hmm. and other things. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what the other right. things were. Sure. And so after that period of time, uh, we uh, arrested a lot of people and charged them with crimes. Yeah. And uh, these business owners hired the best uh, constitutional lawyers they could find in Cincinnati. Uh, and we battled in, in local courts uh, for about six to eight months, maybe a year. And we essentially uh, prevailed on everything. Uh, and they, uh, their employees were, people were afraid to work there because of uh, what might happen. Mm -hmm. And we essentially made it clear to these uh, business folks that if they were going to try to have that kind of business here, that it was going to be a hard way to go. 
and so they just gave up. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're, <laughs> that's a story not many people know. Yeah, it's interesting. But there have been a few others like that. Sure. Uh, and I don't like to talk about it much, but uh, we did what we had to do to make sure that we had a, a, a community that we can be proud of. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't. That's a story I hadn't heard yet, Don. Mm. Thanks. I know you have a lot of them. One other thing you said a while ago, and it kind of piqued my interest, so, and it doesn't follow in, in kind of our notes, but did the TID grow out of the Union Center? I know the TID was involved in the UCB interchange. Was there a TID before the UCB? No, I, I think... I think uh, the TID was really Dave Gully's brainchild. Mm -hmm. And he uh, drafted a lot of people, including Mike Fox, mm -hmm. to get that going. And it was uh, members in that were all the surrounding communities because Hamilton wanted badly to have a connector to I-75, which would benefit us, frankly, because right. it was a way uh, to get both east and west out of the township and north. And, uh, I, I wasn't directly involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the county prosecutor actually put that together. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, uh, and, but I want to say that that started in, in the mid, yeah. mid, mid 90s. Yeah. And uh, right. its, its work was, was complete in, mm -hmm. for the most part in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's still in place and it still does important work but the lion's share of all the efforts and all the uh, dollars that went into it uh, occurred between really 1995 and mm -hmm. 2005. And the dollars made as a result of the value oh, yeah. of property. Oh, my goodness. The Indian Center is unbelievable, right? Yeah, and, and the value uh, to, to Liberty Township, to, to uh, Fairfield Township, and particularly to Hamilton right. and Fairfield, was enormous. It was enormous, and and uh, now I can go from my home in in Westchester to my beloved Miami University in 35 minutes <laughs> as a result of that highway. It's an easy trek now. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Nice. So, are, are there things that have consistently remained the same, or has everything changed? Well, it's a little of both. Yeah. Uh, kind of the backbone of our success wasn't our brilliance. It was the luck of geography. And so our outstanding strategic location remains. But it was the backbone of everything that we've done because when you think about it, you have one of the major interstate highways going through the heart of the township, north-south, and on a diagonal you have I-71, which is a very busy highway. and toward the southern boundary of Westchester, you have I-275. And thanks to the TID, we have now have 129 going east-west at the uh, north end of Westchester Township. So it was the our strategic location that allowed us to do a lot of different things. Uh, so And between Cincinnati and Dayton, right? I mean, oh, yeah. between these two much you know, larger cities, certainly at the time. Yeah, we're, we were kind of the epicenter of the development of that area mm -hmm. uh, because as a result of the development uh, of the township, uh, Liberty Township began to flourish following our lead mm -hmm. and uh, communities up and down. Uh, of course, Middletown was on I-75, uh, but they really didn't take advantage of that the way we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's to our credit. So Yeah. When I moved here 30 years ago, there were um, people, so many people we met, um, talked about one spouse working in Cincinnati and one in Dayton. And that this was right in the middle. And mm -hmm. it made sense for them as a family that way. So yes. I think a lot of people, it, it was, and Lakota schools, of course. So. Yeah. Who knew that? that Pisgah would be so valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought it? The other two uh, elements of our success, I think, was that we have a conservative citizenry that's been very consistent in supporting government and supporting and insisting on good government. Uh, that's been a consistency that I've seen all these many years. Uh, you could always rely on that. 
Uh, and also, we've had very good schools. Uh, the Lakota School District, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago was a rural school, school right. district, really. They had a high school, a middle school, and a couple of elementary schools. And now they're the eighth largest school district in the state of Ohio. And they've had great leadership, uh, particularly these last several years, uh, especially in, in their financial controls and the high quality of education and the kind of teachers that they've been able to attract and keep. Uh, so those three things have remained the same, but everything else has changed. <laughs> everything else. Yeah, and, and it starts with, uh, I guess I would say, that I'm not the only one saying that. Money Magazine, US News and World Report, they all in the 50 to 100,000, 100 person, citizen category. We've, we've been in the top 10 uh, almost consistently uh, for the last 10, 15 years. Once again this year. And there's a reason for that. It's our government, our schools. We have one of the most efficient forms of government in the world. You think about it. We have 67,000 residents and all these employees. And it's governed by three elected trustees a township administrator uh, with the help of uh, some other folks like the uh, fiscal officer in the finance department and their lawyer. And you compare that to most cities, they have layers and layers of decision making. Uh, they have uh, elected councils of five, seven, nine, sometimes 12, like our client city of Lexington. It just you know, the decision-making process is so quick, and uh, that's why it's so important to have really bright, well-intentioned, and informed trustees. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, we've, we've been very, very lucky in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk more about trustees a little bit later. Sure. So we also talk about just the robust business climate, right, and our location and the access and all those things. Uh, that's grown and changed in, uh, over the years. You know, one of, the, one of the other reasons why we've been successful is that we have very low taxes. We have a huge advantage over surrounding cities uh, because cities rely on earnings tax. If you just take a hypothetical of a husband and wife that makes $200,000 a year and you multiply that by a 2.5% earnings tax, over 10 years, that's $50,000 that you're paying in taxes that you don't pay here because all you pay here are your real estate taxes and any levies. And, and so uh, people have figured that out, and that's why they, and, and if they're choosing between two or three different locations, we have a leg up. And the same thing for business because they pay the, that earnings tax as well. And it's given us a huge advantage in tough times because the cities that I, I represent, our firm represents, really struggle when we have a, a recession. And when you have a recession, what happens? Employees get laid off. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have the earnings tax coming in the way you normally do. And so that, those cities have to lay people off and cut back. We don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and over a period of time, and I'll talk about this later, we build up a strong reserve so that if we get to periods of recession, we can continue without layoffs and give uh, wage increases that our communities can't give so our employees actually get ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that helps you keep people. And so it's a, it's a dynamic that has worked really well. And I still say, as I, I've said earlier, Township government, if it's done right, is the most efficient form of government in the world. Mm -hmm. And we're a Exhibit A. <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. Yeah. There's been several attempts to change that. With, that's uh, true. I think, that, that's I, think, I think that's one of the reasons why we've been successful. The citizens that I talked about, the conservative citizens figured all this out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the case against incorporation is it's just going to increase your taxes. Uh, so the citizens rejected uh, incorporation in 
1990-1992, and they didn't actually go to a vote in 2000, but there was a group of very fine citizens in Westchester that put together a study group, about 25 people, to study whether or not we should stay a township or whether we should become a city. And uh, I was invited to participate uh, to give them information. And I remember their lawyer was uh, the general counsel for the Ohio Municipal League. And he was a very fine lawyer and a good guy. And once he went around the township and looked at what we had done, and uh, he had a question for me. He said, how in the hell did you do all this? Where is your authority to do all this? And I said, well, we found it. <laughs> and nobody's ever challenged us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a prime example of one of our fans because that group finally decided that it was wise for us to stay a township because of our success. And so I, I think so long as we can pass levies, mm -hmm. as long as we can continue to pass levies, uh, we'll remain a township. Uh, the tipping point will become when we can't do that. If you can't pass levies to fund police and fire, then you've got to become a city to, to fund it through an earnings tax. Mm -hmm. And we could do that because we have 60,000 people a day that come to Westchester to work, right. and they don't pay an earnings tax. Mm -hmm. So there's a source there of revenue if we need it. It's like money in the bank, mm -hmm. uh, but we're saving for a rainy day. Well, and, and I think another, you know, when we talk about communities like Middletown and, um, and others, I think Westchester is so unique with how we developed in that we have this really diverse economy, right? Mm -hmm. We're not reliant on a specific industry. Right. We've, we've gathered <coughs> a collection of mm -hmm. industries, so. That's very true. A, That's very true. We have uh, a medical industry, hospitals. We have manufacturing. We have uh, warehousing. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of different smaller businesses that make things uh, that uh, are very successful here that like it here because another quality that has made Westchester successful and it's been particularly true the last 20 years is that it's business friendly. We try to make it as easy as we can for businesses to develop and do what they need to do within the context of a very thoughtful zoning code. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know in the last 10 years the township has uh, uh, made a major investment in uh, enforcing its zoning code and making sure that people understand that these are the rules you need to abide by them. If you don't, we'll come after you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that takes revenue and support financially for that to happen, and the, the trustees have, have done that. Did we cover everything you wanted to in that topic here? Well, uh, I think so. Uh, well, you can talk about your Miami regional campus. Well, yes, we, we also have, that's, that's an interesting story because uh, the state of Ohio made uh, about $8 million available as a grant to the universities in the area to create a learning center uh, where they could each have classes taught and so forth uh, in, in a location uh, co-located for all of them. And over, and I was a member of the uh, Middletown Citizens Advisory Board for Miami, and they wanted to know, well, why would we be interested in that? And they didn't, of course, understand Westchester. So I, I explained it to them, and, and they, they bought in, and Miami bought in. And over a period of time of seven to 10 years, all the other universities dropped out except for Miami. And the uh, funding for that grant was due to expire on June 30, 2006. And in February of 2006, I went on the Miami Board of Trustees, and in March, we hired a new president at Miami, because our previous president wasn't interested in a learning center out in Westchester. <laughs> uh, and uh, David Hodge who, uh, was our new president, and he was a geographer by uh, and other, he had his PhD in geography, and he understood all this. He understood transportation. 
he understood the necessity of location and how important that was. And before he had his first meeting with the Board of Trustees, he called all the trustees, including me, and said, this is going to expire with your permission by phone. I'm appropriating $8 million out of our general fund at Miami to fund this project because we need to do this. And so it was really the luck of his hire uh, that made that happen and, his, of course, his great judgment. But I was, that was a very proud moment for me because I had kept that alive mm -hmm. over those years. And 20 acres to build that beautiful facility on that looks like a Miami building right. came from Westchester. Mm -hmm. It was a, a grant of land, and they've, uh, Westchester is also holding uh, another 20 acres adjacent to that if we need it mm -hmm. out at VOA. And of course, the entire VOA project uh, or property uh, is very historic in nature, and what it's done uh, was a gift from the federal government to Westchester and Butler County uh, as a result of the work of John Boehner and his staff mm -hmm. and Gary Cates and, and others uh, to make that available to us. And so. Uh, an amazing gift to the people of Westchester. That's right, sure. that's right. And I'm very proud of it. And it's a beautiful building. And, and, and it's, you know, my, one of, a prime example of why that's, that location is important is Miami's MBA program is located there. Mm -hmm. And so they, they generate students from all the surrounding cities, mm -hmm. you know, Lexington, Louisville, Columbus, Indianapolis, as well as the Miami folks that live in this immediate area. And it's been uh, thriving and highly profitable. Mm -hmm. In fact, Miami moved its MBA program from Oxford to Westchester. Mm -hmm. And they expanded it from one class a semester to two, two mm -hmm. classes a semester, two groups of uh, 20, 25 students. So it's... Uh, and that program gains a lot of attention. I know it does. It's one of the best MBA programs in the... In yeah, the it's very highly rated, yeah. very highly rated. That's great. So, help yourself so to another drink if you need it there. Sure. All right, you have so many important things to tell us about. Your time here is so long, but... Um, so one of the questions I had was, uh, what are three occur occurrences that were most pivotal in creating the Westchester we know today? If you had to pick three, and there's probably more, but... Well, I, I could narrow it down to five. <laughs> okay. And they're all equally important. And, and there probably could be 10 or 15 because there have been some real markers along the way that have been uh, a prime source of our success. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first I mentioned was the State Labor Act in 1984, because financially, that was the foundation of our success, uh, because we were able to recruit and develop and keep a, a really strong workforce. And our contracts, our labor contracts, now we have six, are the standard in the industry. And there's no fat in those contracts, there's no hidden cost, management rights are protected, but our employees have good benefits and really high wages because we put all of our money in the W-2. We put all of our resources in one place, and that's to the benefit of the employees because when they retire, they earn that additional money the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, and you know, our contracts are efficient. You've heard me say that. And we did a study about 10 years ago. We looked at a fire contract cost and the fire department cost for Westchester compared to a close by city with the same number of residents. Uh, they had more parcels, but we have more territory to cover. So they're really equal. And the other labor contract, uh, is, was close to 100 years old, and it was uh, administered by the oldest labor organization in the state of Ohio. And ours was relatively new, but it was very efficient. And when you compared the cost of this city 
to Westchester, Westchester's cost was 70% of what they had to spend. And it's because of the hidden cost in the contracts, the additional overtime that they had to pay, the additional days off, things like that. And so there, is, there are real consequences uh, to having good labor costs, or labor, labor costs and contracts. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was, uh, to me, uh, a foundational reason for our success mm -hmm. over these many years. And we've always been supported by the trustees in these endeavors. And uh, the unions have been, for the most part, very co cooperative because it's a two-way street. It works well for both sides. Mm -hmm. And that's the way collective bargaining is intended. Yeah. So the other it, we mentioned earlier was the rejection of incorporation. Mm -hmm. Because had we gone that route, hard telling what would have happened, but we're very successful the way we are. So, uh, you know, bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, as they say. It works. And then I, I also think in conjunction with that was changing the name to Westchester in 1998 and in 1998 also becoming a um, home rule township because that gave us additional legislative authority, very much like a city, and it took away the argument that people that want to incorporate, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. Well, now we could. And also, and importantly, it gave us the ability to finance a lot of our needs because with a home rule township comes additional bonding capability. It's like significantly increasing the limit on your credit card right. from say five grand to 10 or 10 to 20. Uh, now we've assiduously protected our, our uh, judgments as far as that is concerned. But at the same time, it has allowed us the latitude to do some things that uh, pre-1998 we couldn't have done. Did the idea, did the, the ability to be home rule, did that exist before 1998? And we yes. just took advantage of it in 1998? <laughs> yes, it, it, uh, it was a creature of statute that came into being in the 1970s, okay. I believe. Okay. And so we had been watching it and uh, decided finally it was time. It just seemed like the right yeah. time to do it mm -hmm. in 98. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. Becoming a little bit more complex and sophisticated as a community, and probably just made yeah. more sense at that time. The other thing that becoming a home rule township allowed us to do was to, it gave us m many more tools to avoid annexation. Mm -hmm. In other words, losing portions of the township to surrounding cities, because it was pretty easy for that to occur. Uh, but once we had these additional tools, there was less reason uh, for landowners to want to change to a city where they're going to pay up more tax. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Right. See, so We've only had a couple small parcels, I think, annexed over the years. But those have been by agreement because yeah. there were certain reasons why that made sense. And we, of course, would always go along with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one or two of them uh, took a little negotiation, but it, it wasn't. It was, they were very small mm -hmm. parcels. So, and I think the other important occurrence is our continuous ability to pass levies uh, when needed without having to run them over and over again. Unfortunately, for the Lakota schools, uh, prior to the last seven or eight years, uh, they went a stretch where they, they failed to pass a levy, I think, six or seven straight yeah, times. Right. And that is a killer. That is a real detriment. And we've never had to face that because we've always had good fiscal responsibility. And our citizens trust our trustees who they elect uh, to use good judgment in financial affairs. Mm -hmm. And then I think I talked a little bit earlier about the advantage that we have in recessions. And that was true again in COVID-19. You take the recession of 2008 to 2012, um, 
just using Indian Hill as an example, uh, they had a $12 million operating budget and $26 million in reserve. Mm -hmm. Over that period of time, they lost 40% of their revenue because of layoffs and cutbacks, all the businesses that were paying mm -hmm. uh, taxes, and we didn't have to face that. We had a, a fairly significant reserve uh, that uh, we started growing really in about 2004 when George Lang was elected. George was a fiscal conservative, and uh, you know by that time we were in really good shape financially. had had a reserve of eight or ten million dollars on a 12, ten or twelve million dollar budget, and uh, just we we got through that recession, and 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 that. Uh, uh, and then later, the pandemic, the same way. Mm -hmm. By the time the pandemic came along, we had close to a $20 million reserve when you throw in the reserves that we had in our levy mm -hmm. funds. So uh, those are significant markers in our history that I think have led to our success. Mm -hmm. We and sometimes hear the public question, having that much money in reserve, why aren't we, you know, building more playgrounds or buying more property for parks, or why aren't we doing those things? We have all these reserves. Well, primarily because they're in specific funds that yeah. can only be spent for those purposes. But what what other value really that having this this um, uh, carryover is, um, what's, what's the other value for people to understand? Well, uh, for example, when we borrow money to build roads, uh, to build overpasses, uh, and to add uh, to our other assets in the township, because of our reserves, we get a much lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. So the cost of money for us is extremely low. We have the highest bond rating achievable. And so that, that's something that you have to consider. And, and it's like having a, a nice bank, bank account to rely on if something bad happens in your family. Mm -hmm. You've heard you want to have at least six months of of income in savings. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, we're well above a year in, mm -hmm. in, in that category. So the trustees have always been generous when it comes to community assets, but they've avoided assets that take a lot of maintenance and that aren't essential. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, the, the parks, uh, the county does that for us. We we took a lot of our parks and turned them over to the county because they're better at that than we are. And it's not an essential function. It's important, uh, but it's something that uh, they're better equipped to handle, and uh, we uh, we like the arrangement. Mm -hmm. Very good. Did you kind of touch all those, I think? I made you do more than five. What real quickly would be your other most pivotal things? <laughs> oh. Well, playing and zoning. It, it, well, I I think uh, the, the, the I would stick with just those. Mm -hmm. I I think to add others uh, to the exclusion of the remainder would be. Uh, <laughs> um, but our you know we we have for example we have really great health care. Mm -hmm here in the township. That didn't exist 15, 20 years ago. Uh, you have two great hospitals, a UC hospital and uh, children's hospital, uh, plus all kinds of other smaller satellite hospitals right here. Right. You know, and, and 20 years ago, we didn't have anything. Uh, so that's a huge asset. And I've, I've mentioned the Miami University's presence. Uh, and so the, 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 we've, we've also um, created some recreational opportunities that are important mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction with the county or, or their parks that we maintain. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we've, we've done a, a fair job of making sure that the amenities that we offer in the township are uh, very manageable and nice. So you've talked about them a little bit, but I always like to hear about the uh, influential 
characters, or maybe just maybe not even influential, but just the characters that have been so significant or part of our community's story over the years. And you've talked about a few, but yeah, I talked so. about the initial board being perhaps our our strongest because they were. There are other boards that came along that were very close, and we've always had consistently strong people. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about police and fire because they're an essential uh, part of the township. If you can't provide safety to your citizens, uh, it's, it, you're not gonna be a top flight community. Mm -hmm. And we, we had good police chiefs early on, but John Bruce was really the first modern police chief that I would say. He came to us from the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office, uh, rose quickly through the ranks, became a police chief, and really uh, was a big fan and participated heavily in FBI training, both for himself and his top officers. And they raised the quality of our policing and prevention to the highest possible level. And I think really engaged in hiring tremendous individuals to become police officers. And we were able to hang on to them because of our uh, labor contracts and, and, and our uh, uh, strong incentives uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we've had good police chiefs to follow John. Uh, one of them was a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, so we've had highly intelligent, highly trained, highly educated individuals that have kept us safe. Mm -hmm. And we still today employ cutting edge technology to help that out with our uh, camera system and some of the other things that we do that we really don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we, we really are very smart about in, engaging in the latest technology uh, to enhance our policing. And as far as our fire department, we've had strong fire chiefs all the way along, starting with Jim, Jim Dethridge, who started out as a police officer. Right. And then he became a fire chief and was just outstanding. And I think he was here pretty close to... 30 years. Well, we talked to Jim in our series, so yeah, he, he was, was just, a long time guy. He, he was just wonderful, and he's the one that got, got the fire department up and running and modernized, mm -hmm. and was a, uh, a stickler on having uh, great and safe equipment uh, and cutting edge technology. Uh, and then he was succeeded by somebody that he hired and trained and, and really was uh, like a son to him, Tony Goller. Mm -hmm. Tony was just truly outstanding in every way, and he ran a really tight ship. Uh, and then he, of course, was succeeded by Rick Prenz, who is our current f fire chief and is just outstanding, and very well liked by his staff uh, from the new hire all the way up through the assistant chiefs. Mm -hmm. And he, he just does a great job. They've each been with the department, they, they were each part of the township yeah. for so long, and I think it's interesting that, you know, Jim had Tony as a firefighter with yeah. him, and mm -hmm. then Tony helped bring Rick up. They, they yeah. trained their successors from the very beginning. Yeah, the interesting thing is that when I did the first police contract with Judge Powell at the table with me, together with Mike Burns, John Bruce was on the other side. <laughs> he was a sergeant at the time. And I remember, uh, you know, we had some contentious back and forth that you have in negotiations, but he was a brilliant guy. And I remember after one of these meetings and going back and, and talking to Judge Powell and, and uh, Mike, I said, who is that guy? I said, he's really smart. I really think he's great. And so we've, we've had uh, the tendency in the township to promote people like that and eventually get them on our side of the table. <laughs> and as leaders, when you have that kind of uh, mobility, upward mobility, they make great leaders because everybody trusts them. Mm -hmm. And because they can say, I, I used to be where you were, right. and this is what I think we should do. And, and so they carry a great deal of credibility and, and I think uh, kind of a hidden uh, advantage that we have is we've arranged our collective bargaining and our contracts so that our captains are part of management mm -hmm. and not part of the union. And that's been essential because many communities, I'd say most communities, the captains are in the union. 
And when you have that situation, it's, it's almost a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And it creates uh, problems in many situations that I've had to deal with, but not here. Mm -hmm. And the great strength of our collective bargaining process is that these, these gentlemen and ladies can present our case in a convincing way because they've been where the folks on the other side of the table are. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's one advantage that we've been able to preserve uh, that's very important. And I, uh, that's a proud. Makes it harder to portray the other side as the bad guy. That's <laughs> right, that's right. Our collective bargaining generally is, uh, has been without a lot of rancor and uh, at a very high professional level at all times. Uh, so I've talked about John Bruce and the, the three uh, uh, fire chiefs, but in we've all, all these years only three fire chiefs. That's right. In the fountain from it is three, over sixty years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've also had really great township administrators, starting with Mike Burns, but everybody that followed uh, Dave Gully, Judy Boyko, and now Larry Burks has been really good, mm -hmm. borderline outstanding. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say that uh, I give all of them very hard marks, but each of them were different. They all had areas of expertise uh, that was particularly strong uh, and unique to them. And I enjoyed working with all, I was very blessed to have close relationships with each, and I'm very grateful for that. It is interesting when you look back over time, because I've known most of them, but they, they are very different. Oh, yes. But have their own own vision for the township that kind of meets with, with the overall vision and way of getting there, their own approach, their own. They, they each had different management styles mm -hmm. uh, and ways of handling conflict, uh, but each successful. Yeah. Uh, Not and right or wrong. No. It's different. No. Yeah. And, of course, I've talked about Pat Williams already. She, is, she just really stands out as a, a really good, strong public official uh, and y you could you could say as I have that it was her greatest privilege to serve mm -hmm. her citizens and she, she was a wonderful person still is of course mm -hmm. and the trustees oh my god where do I start <laughs> uh, there are just so many to talk about but I, I would start with Gary Cates uh, because he was uh, on the board of trustees through the 90s and uh, he uh, eventually became a state representative. He was an engineer with Armco, and uh, they at first didn't want him, they, they, they didn't have a position for a uh, part-time engineer. And so when he asked them if he could run for state office, they said no. And uh, he came to me and we talked about it, and Armco was a big client of ours. So we talked to Armco about that, AK Steel at that time, mm -hmm. and said, listen, you employ people to lobby on your behalf with state legislatures. You've got a chance here to have someone on the floor of the legislature that can look out after your interests. Why wouldn't you want to do that? So they changed their mind. And they allowed Gary to uh, do both jobs. Mm -hmm. And he was just truly outstanding as a trustee, but even better as a state representative and then a senator. And now he works uh, for the state of Ohio in higher education, and he, he's just been truly outstanding. And he's one of the most politically astute people that I've ever met. He was an advisor to me on political issues uh, for years, and I, I, we had a, a, a mutual respect for each other's abilities. And he, he's right at the top of the list, as well as uh, Dick Alderson and Jose Alvarez, they both served uh, with distinction. Uh, Dick was particularly involved with the TID in the development of our roads, and, and uh, Jose was just kind of a jack of all trades. He was a GE engineer, very, very bright, uh, and a wonderful guy to work with. Uh, and then, of course, there's the incomparable George Lang. George served for 16 years. And uh, when he started, we had a carryover balance of $800,000. And that's barely enough to make the payrolls. And, and you know, it, it's just a paper-thin margin. Mm -hmm. 
and but we had been operating that way for years. But George changed all that. He added the George Lang uh, business-friendly mm -hmm. fiscal discipline uh, that we had had previously, but not uh, in strong enough doses to make it count. Mm -hmm. And over a period of about 10 years, he helped us build uh, a very significant reserve that really helped us in the Great Recession. And then uh, we, uh, I think at one time when you throw in the the, uh, the amounts that were accumulated in the levies, it was close, close to $20 million. Mm -hmm. So he put us on a, a path uh, to great uh, fiscal success while at the same time being business friendly, more business friendly than we had been in the past. Mm -hmm. And one of the techniques that he used, he used in business. He started his career with uh, Procter & Gamble and of course had some of the greatest training in the world. Mm -hmm. And when he left them, he started a business with his wife and he's very successful in, in the insurance industry and some other businesses that he started. But what I noticed very quickly was that when someone would retire or leave or be terminated or late, you know, whatever, he would ask the question, do we have to replace them? Is there any way that we can parcel out their duties to others? Mm -hmm and save that salary. He asked that question every time. He made the township administrator or the police chief or the fire chief justify every uh, vacancy mm -hmm. to be filled. Such that when George started in 2004 to the time that he ended, we had less employees while the township had enormous growth. Mm -hmm. right. So that that delta, that change, uh, and that savings was significant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was really a good trustee. And of course, uh, at the end of the, those four terms, he decided to run for the state house and was easily elected. And then uh, after a couple of terms, uh, became our state senator. And he's mm -hmm. one of the leaders in the Senate now, and I predict will become one of the uh, statewide office holders and a leader uh, in the future. And so th those folks really stand out to me. In addition to our current trustees, we have a very strong board of trustees at the present time. Uh, Ann Becker uh, was a uh, leader of, of the, the Republican Tea Party, came in with some very dogmatic ideas and very quickly adapted to uh, being a truly outstanding public official, making decisions that weren't part of a personal agenda, but making decisions that were in the best interest of the township, uh, and very easy to work with, and extremely bright. Uh, and then there's Lee Wong. Lee was first elected in the mid-2005 uh, or six, right around then. And he's a really interesting story because he was born and raised in a communist country, communist China. And he came to the United States as a 17-year-old boy, joined the United States Army, served for 20 years. And under the GI Bill, when he got out, he got a, both his bachelor's and his master's degree at the University of Cincinnati in uh, criminal justice. And in every election that he's been in, since he first ran, he's been the highest vote getter because he's just such a plain spoken, a practical guy and he's turned into a really good trustee. Uh, you know, at first he struggled because there were language differences and, and uh, cultural differences. Mm -hmm. But over time, he's, he's really uh, grown into the position and, and is doing a great job. Mm -hmm. And he's, he works well with the other trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there were some bumps in the road early on, but uh, he, uh, he's really somebody that we're proud of. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, there's Mark Welch. Mark uh, is a very bright man, a brilliant guy, very well prepared, very studied. Uh, he started his uh, college career really with the uh, United States Naval Academy. He was a, a cadet. And he wanted to be a fighter pilot, uh, but he had a depth perception problem with his eyes. So he, since he couldn't become a pilot, 
he, he left and uh, came back here and got his degree as a chemical engineer and worked in private industry for about 25 years and then he started a business with his, his wife and they're very successful but he is uh, just a great trustee, free thinker, uh, very, uh, you know, he's set in his ways but he will listen, he will change his mind if you can make the case uh, for a different outcome. And he's, so he's very open-minded. It's the best kind of trustee you can have is somebody that, no, I want to do this. And then you can talk to him about other options. And mm -hmm. they're, they're not so proud that they hang on to their original uh, thought. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our current board of trustees is really strong. I found over the years during the process of election of trustees, right, you, as a resident, I receive a lot of information, a lot of campaign literature, and candidates for a trustee or any position, right, they have all these things that they're going to accomplish or stop, they're going to make it better, they're going to do all those <coughs> things. But I find when they come into our organization and really learn about the operation of the township on a first-hand basis, they learn that things aren't so bad. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They're, 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 their candidate positions are not always well-informed, is the way I would put that. And sometimes the, it's just the product of faulty thinking, let's mm -hmm. face it. But we've been able as a, a township staff, legal, uh, to, to help bring them around to a point of view that works. And we've always had people with open minds uh, of high intelligence and who really care about Westchester, who really care about the citizens, who want to do what is in the best interest of, of the township and good government. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do things around here according to the law. We assiduously follow the law and the highest possible ethical standards. And I can tell you over the years, there's been very few disappointments as far as that's concerned. You're good, I'm just checking to make, yep. Sorry. So I think that's, Oh, last, the uh, Westchester 75 group. Uh, we don't know who they are. They kept it a secret for the most part, except for their leaders, Charlie Chapel and, and uh, Dick Alderson and uh, Larry Schumacher, Chris Wannenberg were some of the more prominent ones. But it was a, a group of investors, many of them builders and developers, who, uh, got contracts with about two or three square miles of landowners in the central Westchester area surrounding I-75, both east and west. And they helped develop this area. And uh, they did it in a way as investors and as developers that they did it in the best interest of the community and not necessarily their pocketbooks. Uh, they consistently chose to not squeeze every dollar of profit out of their projects. They would consistently donate land for, for, for roads. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would do things along the way that what in the long run developed uh, as developments benefited the township that you know, they didn't develop, for example, a lot of apartments and things like that that would uh, put a lot of strain on the schools. Uh, and, uh, you know, my favorite example is something that was shared with me by Larry Schumacher. It said at the very beginning when the uh, Union Center overpass and, and, and Boulevard was under construction, he and some of his fellow investors went to Marriott. And they said, we want you to build your highest end hotel right here. And Marriott said, well, we'd like to do that, but this is what will happen. We build a high end hotel, we charge high end prices, and then pretty soon, within six months or a year, there's a half a dozen other hotels under construction mm -hmm. that undercut our price. We have to drop our price to, make, to fill up our places. We can't make a profit. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that. And uh, the response was, well, we have a solution. 
we will sign a contract with you that we will not sell one stick of land to any developer or hotelier for five years. That'll give you a chance to get up and running and, and, and establish your brand. And do you know what Marriott's response was? Deal. <laughs> they did things like that. They were smart. Mm -hmm. But they looked down the road, not only because they were all local. Mm -hmm. They weren't somebody from Columbus or Cleveland uh, or some other. The potential. They, they did what was in the best interest of the community. Mm -hmm. And these were truly wonderful people. Uh, you can't find anybody with a bigger heart than Patty and Dick Alderson or Charlie Chapel and his wonderful wife. All these folks had something in common, and that is they not only wanted to make a good living, they wanted to share it. And uh, that's why I'm proud to call them all friends. We have a lot of people like that that's made up of, of the leadership of this township. Yeah. So. Right. People with vision and mm -hmm. make it happen. So what are some of the biggest challenges, John, that we've faced over the years? Well, uh, th there's a long list here, but I've shortened it because we don't have all day. <laughs> uh, but it, it's to continue making collective bargaining a benefit for both the township and our employees. And for the most part, our unions are still cooperating. They understand that we have to have control over our right to manage. And when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to give control over decision making and managerial prerogatives to the union. Why is that? Because they're not accountable to the people. We are. You are. Uh, the township administration and trustees are. So why would you give away that lever? You have to maintain that. And that, that is a cornerstone of all, our, all of our collective bargaining agreements, not only here but elsewhere. And I can t show you all kinds of communities that when times are tough and they can't give pay raises, so they give away their management rights. That is so short-sighted. Right. It's, it's like trying to drive a car with great tires, but they have no air in it. It isn't going to work. And so uh, that's, that's one thing. And I think building, continuing to build a township uh, with financial strength keeping taxes low while building reserves. If we continue down that road, protecting our reserves, being in a position during a recession and or a pandemic or something like that, to be able to continue to operate without losing employees. When you lay somebody off, they're gonna go somewhere else to work. They may not come back. Uh, keeping residents and businesses safe you know, that's a constant challenge, and it's a changing world out there, uh, and it's becoming more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. But we've done a really good job of, of making sure that that is our top priority. It really is. Mm -hmm. And we've had, there have been, I can't think of a time when we were on the 11 o'clock news because of somebody screw up. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. And it's... Um you know, this growth, this great growing community and this growing sophistication of the community is a challenge in terms of public safety, right? We've got all these roads, more people come, mm -hmm. more people have easy access to, um, to parking lots and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things along mm -hmm. the highway that has the potential to bring even more crime to us, but we've done a good job staying on top of that. We have, yeah. we have. And uh, we have good leadership uh, in our, our fire management and police management. Really brilliant people that work hard. And what they're really good at is anticipating something before it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a gift, and that's something that's in our DNA in our public safety forces, and I've always admired that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not something that every community has. You know, you, great leadership, you have to determine whether you want to have the kind of leaders that anticipate mm -hmm. or one, uh, one that reacts and follows. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to be the one that 
anticipates and, and reacts that way. So, um, I think also we've done a really good job of maintaining our, our roads and our highways, and we have to keep that up. It's a constant challenge, uh, and it takes a lot of money. And at times we've struggled to do that, but we've always done it. Mm -hmm. And we have to continue to find ways to continue to do that. And that, that's an everyday challenge. Uh, and I think maintaining a highly competent, highly trained workforce is important. And we've worked really hard. We now have a really robust personnel group, personnel, and we have a, an assistant township administrator that does a lot of fine work in that area, keeping us anticipating and leading as opposed to reacting and, and, and following. So, uh, and I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's really important, and that is adherence to operations and policies and decisions that assiduously follow the law and in accordance with the highest ethical standards. Uh, that has been, I know, a cornerstone of my legal practice, our firm's legal practice, and I've never gotten pushback from this client on anything ever. And that's so important for our citizens to know. And it's highly important in government today because there are a lot of challenges out there. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to take a shortcut, but it usually isn't the right way to go. Right. Right. So the final challenge is not only creating but maintaining a brand that is worthy of an outstanding community that our citizens can be proud of. Uh, it's a wonderful place to live. I can say that as a resident for the last 20 plus years. And I, I just have to say that it's been my greatest privilege to serve as the Westchester Law Director. And I wish you the best. Thank you, Don. Did we hit everything? I think we Anything did. Anything else you want to... No. Thought you want to leave, what, leave us with? No, I, I just it's it's uh it's been great and I I won't, I'm not going to be a stranger. Going anywhere. I'll still I the the firm has been very generous with me. Uh, I'm 75 years old now and they still want me around. They they've given me an office and a secretary for life, and uh, I'll still come to some of the meetings and I'll always be around to advise the lawyers that are now uh, advising the township mm -hmm. so far as how we've done it in the past. Uh, I think one of the smartest things I ever did as a young lawyer was uh, I admired the Attorney General's office in Ohio because they give opinions all the time and they categorize them and they, they publish them. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, since I'm going to be representing public clients, I'm going to do that. So. Every time we write an opinion for Westchester or the city of Cincinnati or Dayton, we put that in our database and we organize them by client and by subject matter so that our database now over the last 40 years is about 1,200 opinions. Mm -hmm. And what that does, a lot of them are dated or they need to be updated, but it's, it prevents you from or keeps you from having to recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first place you look when you have a question mm -hmm. you're not sure of the answer right. to it. And usually, the answer's there. Yeah. And the client's already paid for the research. Right. So you just send them an answer and charge them 10 minutes. You know, it, 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 it sure. works pretty well. Sure. And so. Okay. Uh, so a lot of the things we've talked about have been, um, I know sometimes it's difficult to separate them. Um, I'm also a longtime resident here, and you're a longtime resident here, and we work for the community, and we have, you know, these thoughts about our growth and, um, and how we got to be this way. But just speaking as a resident, what's, uh, I mean, what, what does living in Westchester mean to you? Well... You're from the whole area, so I know yes. you're much more regional in nature. But. That that's true, but uh, I don't think I've ever been happier living in a in a in a place like Westchester. And we have so many f close friends 
that are West, Westchester residents. My closest friends now are Westchester folks and, of course, Miami folks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's a great place to live because of the community values. You know, I talked earlier about trying to keep a business out that wasn't so uh, nice. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to maintain great schools, uh, all the amenities that you need in health care and shopping and uh, fun mm -hmm. is right here. Okay. Uh, you don't have to travel very far. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the quality of the, the residents that live here that make it a great place. Mm -hmm. And as a community, we are the beneficiaries of good government. Yeah. And in my career, when I first started with a firm, uh, I had an opportunity to do a lot of different things. And early on, I decided that really the way I wanted to spend my talent and my abilities was doing public service. Mm -hmm. And I was able to convince the firm that this was worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that because Westchester was one of my first clients. And subsequent to that, I probably attracted another 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to convince the firm that representing governments representing schools, representing all kinds of public institutions and colleges was, was good for the firm. Mm -hmm. And they've gone along with that mm -hmm. because we've found a way to make it profitable. We've found a way to avoid the conflicts of interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been the bedrock of a great life and career for me. And I'm very grateful. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. I appreciate it.